was that the grace of God, the giftings of God, would make a way where there seemed to be none. And then, of course, we discover that uh, Paul says that we're not even saved by faith. We're, we're not even saved because we believe that, you know, Jesus was the Son of God. We are saved by grace. It's the willingness of God to bless us regardless of your position, station, or, or understanding. It's just God wants to. All you've got to do is accept it, and it becomes a part of your nature. It becomes the blessing of heaven to you. And then you don't even have to have the faith to begin with. He says, if for every man is given the measure of faith. Yes. So he's given you the measure of faith and then grace freely given. You put the two together and whammo, you have a blessing that's directly from the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he won't take it back. Now you can lose it by being stupid, but the grace is still there. You can lose it by being unrepentant and being stubborn. But the grace remains. By God's grace are ye saved. Not of works, lest any man should boast, I did it. I was too good to be cast into hell. I was too good to fail. I was, I'm too sexy for this stress. Whatever it is. Yeah? It had nothing to do about you at all as a Christian. It has everything to do with you believing and walking in the light of that. Amen. Say amen. amen. Zechariah 4 verse 6 through verse 7. And uh, it, it brought us into a time frame. Times and seasons are important, aren't they? Yes. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. We're, we're going to practice this because I see you didn't get it. All right. Bye-bye. Oh, now, Ecclesiastes 3 one says, Times and seasons are appointed by God, and they're very important, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, see? Now the devil backs up, you see? Otherwise, if you say nothing, he says, Oh, they're easy to take out. Because there's a few people here who are unable to say anything, you say it for them. All right, so he made a statement, which is true and accurate. So it says here that the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel was the one called by God. He was one of the uh, priests of the tribe of Judah, from where we have the lineage of Jesus, was called upon to rebuild Jerusalem's temple. It started with the walls. That's where we all have to start with rebuilding the walls that let the devil in in the first place. Then ultimately the gates which secure the walls. The gates determine what comes in and what comes out of your life. Hmm? All right, so he says, The word of the Lord is, I will not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. That's a wonderful statement, isn't it? Yes. Isn't it? Yes. Very good. You could say amen because that's the statement. That not by might nor by power, but by my Holy Spirit, saith the Lord. No matter what a man determines to do, God says, I will choose who will do it for me. I will choose the timing of it. And I will choose how it's done and how it's paid for. What job you have, who you marry, where you live. All of these things are decisions best left in the hands of God and then by faith wait for his response. Amen. 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 Ah, at least you're trying. Okay. We determine from this is this only a type of the times and the seasons of the body of Christ. And in these last days there are going to be many efforts to undermine the validity of the Holy Spirit, his necessity within the life of every believer, and more importantly, those ministries who are required to be inspired by him. Now, all the five office gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, all of them should be inspired by the Holy Spirit. However, some cannot have a ministry without the Holy Spirit's inspiration. Now, if you think you have to be inspired by the Holy Spirit for anyone to be a pastor, then you're very slow. Because there's a lot of pastors out there who are not inspired by the Holy Spirit at all. There's a lot of ministries out there that are not inspired by the Holy Spirit at all. But you cannot call yourself especially an apostle and a prophet unless you're inspired by the Holy Spirit in what you say. It doesn't mean that you can't have a side of your nature that is, that is carnal or more natural. All of us have a carnal, natural nature. A lot of the men in this house, including myself, have the same things that we have to fight against that every other man does. The difference is, of course, we realize that repentance by the grace of God leads us to a place where we can live a life, for the most part, which is outside of the influences that pull other people down. 
Hopefully we can stay on that side of the fence. The Apostle Paul knew that struggle very well when he said, you know, nevertheless, the things that I want to do, I don't. The things that I shouldn't do, I do. God help me. Who will rescue me from this body of sin? Thank God Jesus. Right? So you, it's a progression of learning to say no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, yes, no, no, yes, 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 no, no, no. Until eventually you say no, 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 no. And it takes a lifetime. Anyone says they're there right now, pray for me. No? So, thank you, sister. So, once we've sort of established some of these things, I realize that there's an opportunity now for the body of Christ, just as it was here to Zechariah, there's an opportunity, or as Zerubbabel, to be opposed by those who don't want to see the house of God rebuilt. Do you know that the, the body of Christ, in, the church itself, the body of Christ is under severe attack. We're under, you know, missile attack right now. The fiery missiles are the wicked one. They want to take out your leadership, take out your apostles, take out your prophets, take out the base upon which you stand and give you teachers that will itch your ears for you. You know that, don't you? See? There's a reason people choose to come to a house which for the most depends upon your willingness to make choices that most people won't make because it's the only way we can contact ourselves with God fortunately for us we are dealing with God who is love Amen. and a God who is holy and we do neither we are not holy and we don't love as we should Psalm 30 written by David uh, this was just prior to his dedication of the rebuilt house of the temple and David says now, if you know anybody that it was a professional screw-up, it was David. I mean, David had a lot of problems, didn't he? I said, didn't he? But one thing he had down pat was he recognized what it was to serve God with a whole heart. And serve Saul with a whole heart, even though Saul tried to kill him on three occasions. But David also was a man's man. He was a very rough-hearted man. He had a tender heart when it came to worshipping God, but he was a very uh, bold man, put it that way. And uh, got into trouble with this Bathsheba. Now, you know the story, right? But that wasn't the worst part as far as God was concerned, if I may have that grace, the fact that he was perving at her through the window. The worst part was that he determined he wanted her. Okay, still not so bad. Because God has mercy upon us. He created men to be men and women to be women. The worst part was that he arranged to have her husband killed so he could have her. He shed innocent blood. Now, if you think about sword for sword, word for word, eye for eye, the shedding of innocent blood with the husband, who was a good man by all intents and purposes. He didn't even sleep with his wife when he could have because he, he didn't want to go to battle you know, messed up in his head. But there was a baby brought in the picture and that baby was innocent and cost the baby its life. See, innocent for innocent. Blood for blood. And when we're talking about grace, just for a minute to divert for a minute, we're talking about grace when Nathan the prophet was sent to see David to help David open up his eyes, which he didn't want to see what he had done. He told him the story, a member of the little lamb, he said there was a man that had a lamb and the lamb was just like a daughter to him. And he loved that lamb, looked after that lamb, you know, a bit strange, I know, but nevertheless. Of all the lambs there in that flock, he said there was a visiting king came and took that lamb and slaughtered it for his own satisfaction. And David was so upset. The prophet said, why are you upset? He said, that man, what he did was terrible. We're talking about a sheep, a lamb. And the broken heart, he must have been. He said, that man should be put to death. And what was the answer? Thou art the man. Then David's eyes got open and he said, what have I done? And it says in 2 Samuel, I think it's around 30, I'm not sure. And it says that the, he said to the prophet, Nathan, that man should be killed. But Nathan turned around the prophet and spoke the word over David the king. He said, you're the man, but you shall not die. 
Now that's a definition of grace. Huh? Yes. And that grace I can carry on through. It can start in the book of Genesis with the grace of God that was offered, you know, to Adam and Eve. Yeah. Carried all the way through into the New Testament. When you find over and over again, God extends grace where grace was not required, and yet God still offered it. Where forgiveness still gets granted to you and to me when we don't deserve it. Oh, Moses struck the rock not once but twice with his rod. He used the authority God had given him to directly oppose a commandment of God. Thou shalt speak to the rock because you're under the New Testament. We speak to Jesus and Jesus causes refreshment to come out of the rock, you know, out of the rock. But Moses knew that he had authority and he struck the rock not once but twice with his rod saying my authority is great enough to override the commandment of God. And God said, because you've done this thing, you see that land over there? That's the promised land. You're going to get there. And yet we find in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he was right there on the Mount of Transfiguration. And I closed last week with that. That Peter said, oh, this is awesome. Let's build a tent. One for you, one for Moses, which represented the law, and one for Elias, which was the prophet. Let's build, let's build a tabernacle that will honor Jesus Christ, the law, and the prophets. And God spoke and said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. But the point I'm making is not so much that the law had passed away, because the law has not passed away. The law has simply been fulfilled through Christ. And the prophets of old have not passed away, they're still alive. But the point was that Moses, who sinned directly against the commandment of God, who was pronounced by God guilty, worthy of death, we find him later on, over there in the promised land. <laughs> now I've been on that mountain. It's in the promised land. So what we're saying is God forgave Moses even before Jesus Christ's death, burial and resurrection. Why? His grace. God is a God of grace. It says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6. In that he and eight souls were saved from the destruction of the world. Did he do anything? Did Noah do anything to deserve it? No. He built the ark. Woo woo. Did he obey God's voice? Yes. But he was just as guilty as fulfilling the requirements of punishment as all of the others. Except, he said, he found grace in the eyes of God. <laughs> Probably because of his actions and his lifestyle. I don't know. But, but all the others died. Everybody died except the ones whom God had shown his grace upon. Abraham, same way. Abram was told, he, Abram was not even a Jew. Came out of Ur of the Chaldees, a family of idol makers. And yet, Abram heard the voice of God. Get ye up from where you're at into a place that I will show you. Abram became Abraham, the father of faith. Father of faith of all, quoted all through the scriptures as the father of faith, one who obeyed God, even though he had many opportunities to disobey God. And here's this guy, Abram, whom God says, stay down where you are and dwell in that land there. And he says, I will, Lord. And what did he do? The, the drought got worse, the famine got worse, and he pulled his whole family up. He married, <laughs> he married a black woman, which was unusual. And by the time this was happening, he had a couple of kids on his and he upped and moved into Egypt. God said, don't go into Egypt. He went into Egypt. And he was worthy of death because of that. If he were to deny God. Then it says later on in Genesis that he, was, he uprooted himself out of Egypt and went back the way that God told him to originally. But this time he went back with silver and gold. Because... He repented to God that he had made a mistake. Now, while he was in there, he had all kinds of problems. He had a, his Sarah, his wife, was very beautiful. And so uh, the, the king or the pharaoh apparently had one look at this woman. And he says, I want her. She's, she's cute. And so his decision to go back into Egypt had all kinds of ramifications, which caused him and his family a whole lot of heartache. And yet through all of this, put yourself in this position, because I've put myself in this position. 
How many times have you put yourself in a place where you did exactly the opposite of what God told you to do? You knew you were doing wrong. You had egg all over your face. Your knees were skinned. You had blood squirting out of your eyes. Everything was bad. The king said, I want your wife. And he says, it's not my wife, it's my sister. So he lied. Now he compounds everything that he's done wrong. And yet through the whole thing, when the Pharaoh was getting ready to take her into the bedroom, God spoke to him and he said, uh-uh-uh. Huh? And I don't quite know what Abram was thinking all this time, but he knew something bad's going to happen. And God spoke to the Pharaoh. He says, go ahead, but you'll die. Because this woman is a, is a prophet's wife. All of these things, guilty of death, punishment by death. And yet, God comes to the rescue. Why? One reason and one reason alone. Now, I'm going to substitute the word grace here for a minute for the word love. Under the New Testament, agape, the love of God, which most people, including yours truly, didn't even at this point have a thorough revelation of just how much God loves me. And how much, how far he is willing to go to extend that love to me so that I'll make it. Now we call that kind of love charis. Am I boring you? Then we were trained to believe that love is rated on what people do for us. Now think about this for a bit. If you jump through the hoops for me and do the tricks that I want you to do for me, then I will, according to the world system, I will love you. I appreciate you because people get married because of the tricks that the other person does for them. I didn't mean to sound that in a weird way. <laughs> but probably that's pretty true. We marry the other person because they look the way we want them to look. They say what we want them to say. They, they manage to make us happy in the things which we like to be made happy in, whether that's spirit, soul, body, finances, or relation, relationally. But what happens when they stop doing those things or they can't do those things anymore? Ah, now we see why the divorce rate, even amongst Christians, is through the roof. Because if we love the other person enough, we would love them whether they jump through a hoop or do their tricks or not. Wouldn't we? Do we? Yes. No. We don't. You don't even do them now. If, if your buttons don't get pushed, it's only a matter of time before you start pushing back. Amen. I wrote this down somewhere because to me it was really a mind blower. The difference between the world system of love and God's system. The world system is performance centered. Am I right? Now you tell me if you don't hear, a lot of people say to you, I don't know why God let that happen. Why did God let her die or he die? Why, why did God get, allow me to get cancer? Why did God cause this to happen and that to happen? Why did my roof fall in? Why didn't God stop me losing my job? Why doesn't God heal my physical body? What we're really saying is that we have found God faulty. Why? He doesn't do my tricks. But here's the switch, and it's weird. If I can switch that judgment off and accept wholeheartedly the love of God, my body can get healed. Because it's the criticism of the love that I appear to be receiving from God, which I compare to the love which I appear not to be receiving from my other father, my, my natural father, my natural mother, my siblings, my husband, my wife, my uncle, my aunt. The rejection that I feel from them is simply the spirit of rejection. is only directly proportionate to the fact that I have judged them as not jumping through my hoops, as not fulfilling my needs. If you love me, if you, if you really love me, then you would fulfill my needs. Even if my needs are weird. This is a revelation I'm getting from myself. That if you say you love me, God says, then you prove it by showing me the way you love your brothers and sisters. And we don't. 
No, I'm speaking for me now. Because there's times that people drive me crazy. I'm sure I'm the only one in the world. Well, I would just love to rear on back on my back later and let them have it. At least verbally. I'm more and more finding myself, is that the way you would like God to respond to you? When you do dumb stuff. Which, by the way, you do a lot. Things guilty, worthy of death. To a holy God. Like crawling in behind the veil, you know. Remember they had tied little things to them with a bell, you know, the bell stopped ringing, they, well, they were dead, pull them back out again, right? So we still approach that veil today, but we are approaching the veil with the robe of righteousness on, which is colored red. And because of that, we are allowed access to his throne. And when we get there, we must expect mercy. If you doubt the mercy is there, you'll drop dead. You see, see? It's kind of scary, isn't it? But, but when I started thinking, this, this world system uh, is a love that requires tricks. Hmm. It's based, here's the whole thing. And I love this. The whole world system of love, all of it. And we relate to God for the most of us. We relate to God the same way because that's what we're trained in. Is based on feelings. Isn't it? It's based on the senses, which how many times you've heard me to say, spiritually speaking, is useless. It's the sixth sense, the sense of faith, grace, and love, which operate together. Because love equals grace, grace equals love. So if I have a faulty revelation of love, then I must have a faulty revelation of grace. See? I spent years suffering under a spirit of rejection about my father because I had judged him. And in my eyes, I had every right to judge him because he didn't do any of the things that dads are supposed to do. He never showed up when he made appointments. I'm standing there all day waiting for him to come to take me to lunch. He never shows up. All of, you know, cry my little eyes out, you know. And then when I saw him, I didn't say anything because I knew in my heart it was wrong to judge my father or say the things to his face that I was feeling in my heart. I didn't get a chance to say those things to him until a few months before he died. And then I got a chance to sit down with him and say, Dad, why? If you love me, why? You never gave me a kiss on the cheek. Why? You never gave me any physical gifts when I was a kid. You gave them all to my brother. Why? You never showed up when you promised me you would. Why? The one day you did show up, you smelt, you smelt like, a, like a, a scotch bottle. I never saw my father drunk. That didn't mean much. He just drank a lot of scotch. Huh? At least it was good scotch. He tells me. I don't know. Never liked it. However, my judgment of his love to me was based on what he did not do, not what he did do. Because what he did do is not necessarily what I wanted him to do. See, I wanted my little doggy to do a certain trick, and he wouldn't do the trick. He'd roll over, he'd get a ball, but he wouldn't jump through a hoop. Stupid dog. Get rid of this stupid dog. Dog's not stupid, just doesn't want to jump through a hoop. And there's always a way that I can get the dog to run through a hoop by giving it little treats, which is what you and I do to people who we want to love us that don't. Men have known that for years. They just buy expensive gifts for the woman they're trying to seduce. Oh, am I in the world's class here or something? And what do women do? They want the men, for whatever reason they want them, and they get them by doing tricks. By pretending. Do you believe that? Yes. That men are actually gullible enough, ladies, to believe that you love them because you say the things that women who are in love say. And we immediately presume that because you say those things at the appropriate times, that you love us. Well, how in the world did you just get up and walk out the door? Because you didn't love me, that's why. I just did what you needed to see me do or hear me say to get you to love me. It's like years ago when they did this uh, one hour pr um, uh, prayer, you know, where you're supposed to lie on the floor with your nose on the carpet for an hour and pray. Could you not tarry with me for an hour? The very well-known pastor pushed that, and I was into that whole thing. All I got out that was 
things up my nose and made me sneeze. And <laughs> then one day I sat up and said, this is stupid. I don't want to pray for an hour. I don't want to pray for a minute. In fact, well, I'm hungry. I've got to eat something. <laughs> now, do you know God would prefer that? He'd say, I don't want to do this, Lord. I'm hungry. And I, well, go eat then, boy. And, and on the way to there, give me thanks for what you're eating. Give thanks after you've eaten it. And that's good enough for me. <laughs> right? But we weren't taught that. We didn't show up for an hour. They were always looking at you like, who got up? Who got up? And a lot of people did. They wanted to get up, but they wanted to please the pastor. And the pastor wanted you to please him by lying on your face in the carpet and mumbling for an hour. Now, some actually liked to do it. They were intercessors. They enjoyed doing it. I never enjoyed doing that. And I got set free by T.L. Osborne, miracle, miracle man. <laughs> and he said to me, son, all prayer is is talking to God. I said, what was that? Actually, he said two things. All prayer is is talking to God when you are of the mindset to talk to him from the heart. He used to say in French, le faire de l'écour. It's a, it's a matter of the heart. I speak a little French. So when he said that, it set me free. Because I realized that God loves me even when I don't love myself. He loves me when I don't, when I don't love God. When I say I don't care about God. Because he sees the times that my heart's right and my head's right, you know, and he honors me for those times. All right, let's go to Romans 5. Uh, we'll talk more about love again some of the time, but we talk about God's example, that he commanded his love, Romans, I think it's Romans uh, 5, around 8. When did he commend his love for us? While we were yet sinners. Awesome. Now, if he loved me while I was a sinner... He's got to be ecstatic <laughs> now that I don't have any sin. Now, let's talk about this not have any sin thing, all right? Because that's always bugged me. The scripture that says we don't sin. Well, we all do. Well, scripture says that I shouldn't, but I do. So Romans chapter 5, and I hope this is helping because we're going to talk more about love and grace and mercy Amen. and the gifts. Now, we all talk about the gifts, right? All of you guys are in America are hungry for the gifts, most of you don't operate in the gifts, even the grace gifts that many of you are discovering that you have, right? Yes. Are you looking at the thing, the, thing that, the thing that you flow in very easily without worrying too much about? You know, it's like a gift of service. Blondie, you're another one that has that gift of service and, and caring about people. And you, you, love, to, you love to present your, 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 uh, your, your praise and your worship before God and helping other people. You love helping other people. You're always helping people with this, and have you tried that? And blah, blah, blah. That's a grace gift. That keeps turning people on with you, no matter where you are and what you do. That you just love people. It's an act of service, gift of service. Some people do it in more tangible ways. Other people do it because they get the information that's helpful to other people and then share it with them. That's awesome. You know, that's awesome. But uh, this whole thing of, 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 the, of the sin uh, that so easily... But I want you to read this from Romans... Uh, and, and the gifts, oh, the grace gifts, we can talk about that in Romans 13. And Paul says, all the gifts are worth nothing without love, right? Yeah. Now we're going to talk about that next time we get together. Because you ought to be searching after love more than you are after the gifts. Yeah. Yeah? See, now, now, now you can operate in a gift that's a grace gift, and it will help people, whatever that grace gift, prophesying, whatever it might be. But what God is saying here through the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit is saying is, if you don't have that foundation of agape love while you're doing it, all you are is a clanging bell. It gets the attention of people, but it doesn't really have the root content and the power or the force that agape love. And most people don't know what I'm talking about, but you will eventually get it because I'm going to start teaching you more and more and more about it. Why am I doing that? Because not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, is going to rebuild the house. The remnant has to flow in those three things. The power of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, the agape love of God, hope, faith, and grace. If we've got these five things operating in your life, you will be a force, literally a force, because these are force fields. These are force gifts that will drive the devil far from the, from the presence of you. I'm telling you, it will. Now, I'm still working on one or two of them myself. And I'll continue to work on them because I have to. I have to be willing to cut myself off from the old man to let the new man rise up. Amen. See? That means you've got to be where you're going to hear this stuff in order to do it, right? 
that make sense? How can you make an omelette if you're not even in the freaking kitchen? Yeah? How can you make an omelette if you don't want to break an egg? Well, I don't even have any eggs. Wait a minute. I don't even have a refrigerator. And by the way, I'm in the garage. Well, <laughs> things, some things have got to be changed. Well, why? I'm, I'm having church in the garage as much as I'm in the kitchen. The difference is you said you wanted to make something to eat. You said you wanted to be productive. I've already got a car for the garage. I don't need you in there. I need you where you're going to be productive, where you can create something that other people can eat. Good God Almighty, how much clearer can I make it? Amen? Oh, gee, Lord. You know, people have died to hear what you're hearing. They've been martyred for what they... Not too many martyrs today, although it's coming. And I promise you, it won't be some of the milk sops that you've been listening to who will spend all day banging on a drum or playing a guitar. Nothing wrong with playing a guitar, nothing wrong with banging on a drum. But that's not, that's not the word of God. It's a pretense to it, and it's wonderful. And I love praise and worship, I love that. But see, it's all pretense to war. And you can't go to war with a drum. Not if you're on the front lines. Well, I'll back that up. Actually, they were on the front lines. But you can't fight an adversary with a drum or with a guitar. Now, people will say, yes, you can, yes, you can. But what I'm talking about here is using the word of God because that's the only thing Satan responds to. The praise and worship brings in the presence of God, yes. But what defeats the devil? The word of God. And how are you going to know the word of God if you don't hear it? And if you don't hear it, how are you going to have any faith? And if you haven't got any understanding of grace, how can you operate in faith? Because they're twin sisters. Hope, grace, and faith are actually triplets. That's why I'm trying to help you with it. It's helping me. It's got to help you. Am I right? Am I right? All right. Romans 5. I'm going to hurry. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore being justified by faith. I'm starting verse 1. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace which helps us to stand. What grace is that? The knowledge of Jesus Christ's salvation. Five, verse 15 now. But not as offense, but so also is as a free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, that's the first Adam, much more grace of God and the gift by grace, which is seen by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. The grace now through one man's life and death abounds unto many. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness or right standing with God shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory. See how powerful grace and faith is? Amen. Eh? Now, verse 20, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. So keep you, in, keep you in bondage, keep you in legalisms. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. See, you can't outweigh grace. Grace is the heavyweight. <laughs> Glory be to God. That's a, that's a life changer. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now he goes on to explain it, but here's the answer. The love of God, the agape love of God, once it's entrenched in your heart, the knowledge of God is love. He will never abandon you, never forsake you. That the love of God can't be moved out of the way. You can't get under it, around it, over the top of it. It's all-encompassing, all-knowing, all-powerful, and always present. Glory be to God. Somebody ought to get excited. All of these things, all of these things are saying the love of God guarantees your freedom from sin. Along with repentance, see? Along with repentance. The fact that we... Ask God to forgive us. He is just and faithful to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness and heal our hearts. Glory to God. The forgiveness of our sin through grace, love, and mercy. Awesome stuff.